Good singing. morning, church. Let's stand together, please. Let's make this our prayer as we begin worship this morning. glad that you're in worship with us today. Please let us know that you're here and how we can pray for you by filling out a connection card for us this morning. It's a joy and pleasure to have you. Thank you. And please make note of special things that you can be involved with in the uh, coming months. We're going to be starting life groups soon. We hope you will consider that. And we are so glad you're here today and we welcome you if you're visiting for the first time. Turn around now and greet someone and welcome them. Okay. Okay. church. Before our time of prayer, I invite you to remember our list of prayer concerns found in uh, this morning's worship email. Uh, first, let me say that uh, right now, as far as we know, uh, Pastor Kevin and wife jo Jody um, 
she was due yesterday, uh, still hasn't had baby Isaiah. Uh, Kevin said he's hoping by this evening, but if not, then they probably will induce her tomorrow. So prayers for, for Kevin, Jody, and Isaiah. The list of prayer concerns mentioned this morning are uh, very general. Return to health for all those ill, healthcare workers and first responders, students, teachers, and administrators. Certainly very, very worthwhile needs. And as I said, although mostly general, uh, all of us at some point or in some way have been affected by these concerns and our prayers especially are for those right now dealing with the uncertainties, stresses, and repercussions of those life realities. Bless them. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you in stillness and openness to the moving of your Holy Spirit within each of us and among us. Just a few weeks ago, we sang these Christmas words, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. In our Christian scriptures, over and over, we see the wondrous ministry of Jesus among us, a ministry of movement with his calls to fear not and peace be with you. Get up and walk and go and do likewise. How appropriate then, dear Lord, that who we say we are as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ is that we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. Indeed, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring wholeness to others. As we hear your word preached today, we are reminded of the gift of community. We all live in and act upon so many communities communities of health and well-being, communities of faith, communities of political, civic, and societal realities, communities of education, commerce, of neighborhoods, workplaces, our families and friends, even with those we deem the other. And you call us to move in wholeness throughout these fragmented communities. How are we to do this, dear Lord? One way is through heaven's blessing of encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 exhorts, Therefore encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Or put another way, with a little help from my friends. So, Father God, we remain open to your movement within the fragments of our own lives, even as we receive from or encourage others with words or money, time given, prayers offered or actions taken. Truly, Lord God, your strength is sufficient for all of our needs and steps toward wholeness. Hear now our blended voices of prayer and praise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yes, if you want to call me a drum major, call me a drum major for justice, call me a drum major for peace, call me a drum major for righteousness, and all of these other shadow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind, I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind but I want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I have to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show someone they're doing wrong, then my living is not in vain. 
If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the master taught, then my living is not in vain. I want, to, I want Phil to stay for a moment after they sang and say thank you, Phil, for what you mean to our church. You've been such a good friend to us, but thank you for what you mean to our city and the work that you're doing. Phil, uh, you probably know this, is the Interim Executive Director for Greenwood Rising. And so, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, thank you. 
And uh, I asked him before the service, I said, on the eve of the anniversary, we celebrate the great work, life, and ministry witness of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What's the one thing you would like to say to Harvard Avenue Christian Church this morning? It's not just uh, a particular sermon or a portion of a sermon uh, that uh, I recited this morning. That is actually one of my favorites, and it's a sermon that he spoke uh, to his congregation four months, I mean two months to the day that he was assassinated. He spoke that on February 4th, uh, 1968, he was assassinated April the 4th, and it was his call to his congregation that he knew his time was coming to a quick end. Um, and the sermon is called The Drum Major Instinct. Everybody wants to be out front. Everybody wants to be the one leading the parade. But what do you want to be remembered for? And when he says, if these things I can be known for doing, just serving mankind, my life will not have been lived in vain. And so that's the charge to us. Are you living your life in vain? Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be reading from uh, Colossians chapter 4, and uh, it's so grateful to have Phil here this morning with our guys, and um, I titled the sermon uh, with a little help from my friend. Does anybody know what group made that song popular? The Beatles. Do you know who was the person who sang the vocal track on it? Ringo Starr. Ringo Starr. Do you know who sang it at Woodstock? Joe Cocker. So I was thinking about this morning, we're going to be talking about friendship and the power of friendship, and I also thought we could have also titled the sermon, We Shall Overcome, because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not do that work on his own. He was surrounded by a whole team of people. He was the speaker on behalf of a whole movement of people, and they were able to advance what they were able to do together as people came together. So today we're going to be talking about friendship, and we're going to be hearing about those who were around the Apostle Paul, chapter 4, verse 7. Tychius will give you a full report about how I, am, how I am getting along. He is a beloved brother and a faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. I'm also sending a there we go. Omnimesis, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. He and Tychius will tell you everything that's happening here. Aristocus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. And so, you were, as you were instructed before, make Mark welcome uh, if he comes your way. Jesus, the one we call Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers they are working with me here for the kingdom of God, and what a company, a company and comfort they have been. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship, and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you uh, that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved director, doctor, sends his greetings, and so does Demas. Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. Will you pray with me? Lord, bless these words and the words of my mouth, and may what I prepare be your words. Open my heart and our heart to your leading and direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Ever been to say? I want to share with you a, a, a personal story about something that happened to me this week. I will say that before I share the story, I did receive permission to, to share the story. I called and said, can I tell you the story? I just want you to know so that if you ever have a conversation with me, I would never share that conversation in front of a group of people while it asking your permission first. Uh, but early in the week, early in the morning, as I was uh, getting up and making my way to church, I received a text will you please call me? Do you have time to talk to me today? And I called 
right away, I, I, it sounded urgent, so I called my friend. And it was a young friend of mine who's living in South Carolina. Now, he's in his mid-20s. Uh, I've known him since he was a freshman in high school. We've known each other a really long time, and we talk from time to time. He got on the phone, and he told me that he is really struggling. He's having a hard time and just needed someone to talk to him. He's mentally and emotionally fatigued and tired. He's been working on a degree for six or seven years. He's had a lot of starts and stops. He's changed majors multiple times. He's gone to three or four different schools, and he still has a year or more left. And he's not sure what he even wants to do. After all this time, he's still unsure about his future and his direction. And then he said this. He said, I just don't feel connected to anyone. I don't feel connected to any friends. And I don't feel connected to God right now at the moment. I'm just kind of lonely. Now, I won't cite all the research. And there's a lot of research. I could cite lots of research done over the last 24 months about the impact of the pandemic on our mental health and sense of well-being and our anxiety and loneliness. It's been an isolating time for a lot of people. But I will say this, all the research indicates that the last 24 months have been a time of great intensified loneliness and isolation for lots of people. You might even say that we've had a pandemic of loneliness. All the feelings of loneliness and anxiety that people had prior to the pandemic have been accelerated by what's happened over the last 24 months. And you would think that the people who have suffered the most in the last 24 months might be some of our older folks, our older friends, who are living alone. But that's not what the research indicates. The research indicates that those who have been suffering and struggling the most are those who are teenagers up to the age of 24 and young adults. The research indicates that they are experiencing tremendous amounts of loneliness in spite of our ability to be connected technology, with technology. And 60% of all young adults surveyed have talked about intensified mental anguish and struggle. And this is what distressed me, and I found this almost actually hard to believe, but it was reported by the CDC that in the last 24 months, one in four... One in four of all young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 have had thoughts about taking their own life in this last period. That's how lonely it's been. Now, I haven't done my own research, but my own anecdotal evidence from being connected to young adults like my friend in South Carolina is it's spot on. For whatever reason, young people have really suffered for the last 24 months. So he told me what was going on. He was thinking about changing and going to another school, changing another major. He said, I don't think I can finish it. I, I, I just can't finish. He said, I'm just, I'm just having such a hard time not being connected to anyone and no one to encourage me. And as we talked, I realized and listened to him for more than an hour, he didn't need a minister. He didn't need a Bible verse. He didn't need a inspirational quote. He didn't need a life coach or a therapist. He just needed a friend. And so as we talked, I just listened to him for an hour. He talked about what was going on and offered a little bit of suggestion here and there. And at the end of the conversation, as we were wrapping up, I said to him, I said, it's understandable what you're going through. I understand. It's understandable. There's nothing wrong with you other than what's wrong with the world and that a lot of people feel alone the way that you do. It's really hard to be lonely when you look around and you feel that other people aren't lonely. And I said to him, I said, what you're going through is not unusual. And I said to him, hang in there. Finish your degree. You can do it. I, I said, I'm so proud of you. Maybe you've not taken a traditional path, but hang in there. I'm proud of you. And then I said, I ended with these words, I love you. And the phone got real quiet. And I could hear on the other end of the line, my friend, my young friend, was crying. I've known him since he was a high school freshman, and he was a knucklehead then. <laughs> you know, full of energy and life. I've never heard him cry and never seen him cry. 
And I realized in that moment an important reality that we all need to embrace at this moment in time, how important it is and how much we need the help of our friends. If you don't take away anything else from this sermon on this cold day, if you don't take away anything else, if you you just have one takeaway, let it be this. We need to be better friends. Uh, We shall overcome with our friends. Be a better friend. Be available to someone else. Pick up the phone and call. Reach out. Write the letter. Send the note. Reach out the hand. Give someone a hug. Tell them you're proud of them. It's so good. It doesn't matter how old you are. It's so good to hear someone say, I'm proud of you. I'm proud to know you. Listen, don't be a coach. Don't give advice. Just listen and look to the people around you and tell them that you love them. Because we all need friends. You may remember the great speaker of the house, the great Sam Rayburn. Uh, Sam Rayburn served as the speaker of the house of representatives longer than anyone else in U.S. US history. Served for 17 years beginning in 1940, three different terms. One night, uh, one of his friends, uh, his uh, daughter died suddenly in the middle of the night and unexpectedly. The next morning, the speaker of the house, Sam Rayburn, got up and went over to his friend's house, knocked on the door. His friend came to the door, was surprised to see the speaker at the house standing at his front door. And he said, how are you? And he says, understandably, you know, we're upset, we're distraught, we're grieving, we're just trying to make sense of things. And Sam Rayburn said, well, what can I do to help, what can I do to help you right now? And he said, I don't know if there's anything that you can do because we're just, we don't know what to do. We're just trying to make arrangements. And he said, well, have you had breakfast? Have you had coffee? No, no, we haven't. And Sam Rayburn just went right past and went in the kitchen, started making him breakfast, and started making him coffee. And while he was preparing the coffee, the man walked in and said, Mr. Speaker, I thought you were supposed to have breakfast with the president this morning. He said, I couldn't. I called the president and told him I couldn't make it because I had a friend who needed me. We all need to be that kind of friend. There was a study called the Grant, uh, the Grant Harvard Study of Human Development. They began it in the late 1920s. Uh, they studied about 500 men over the length of their entire lives. It's the longest longitudinal study in uh, American history, maybe in history period. They asked the question, what makes life meaningful and fulfilling? They studied people who graduated from Harvard. They also studied people who had not gone to college and who worked in different fields and who lived in an inner city urban environment. And they studied them over the course of their entire lives. Over And 80 years later, they still are working on this study. Extensive interviews uh, uh, and research on these men's lives. You know what they discovered? Three things that make for a meaningful and happy life. The first thing to discover is that success is a lifetime thing, that how we describe what happens to a success happens over a lifetime, so get a long view of things. The second thing they learned is that happiness and fulfillment comes from having some degree of emotional intelligence, being able to discern the emotions of others and respond to them, and being able to be in tune with your own emotions and to show emotions and to be intelligent with regarding emotions. But the third thing, the greatest finding of this 80-year study should not surprise anyone, that you know what makes life good and fulfilling and meaningful? You know what it makes it possible is to be the people that we're called to be? You know what it makes it possible to get up every morning and fight back the darkness and fight back loneliness? Our relationships. Relationships, relationships, relationships. What they discovered is that loneliness uh, ends life, comes with all kinds of health concerns. But a person's wealth, uh, a person's IQ, a person's educational level did not have the same level of impact on a person's life that meaningful, deep, satisfying friendships and relationships So when it comes to doing something difficult in the world, we need friends. Well, it's working against some injustice or some concern in the community. We need the help of our friends. When it comes to rebooting our life, beginning again, starting over, because life is full of ups and downs. I mean, we think we're just about to get over this thing, and then everybody we know gets the virus, and they're not here this morning, or they're not coming. You know, we just have all these ups and downs, and we have to reboot our life again and again and again, 
But to start over, uh, we need friends. It's hard enough to begin again, but without friends, it's almost impossible. You know that old Zambian proverb that says, we can run fast alone, but we can run further together, you know, with our friends. We need the help of our friends. So that passage I read earlier, when I butchered some of the names, <laughs> for all the pastors, uh, well, long-term pastors sitting on the front row here uh, from First Methodist Church, served for 40 years at First Methodist Church. You knew when Kelly, when he was a mean little boy. <laughs> I'm pronouncing Bible words and can't say the names. Last service, I read the names differently. Most of the time when we get to this fourth chapter here in Colossians and we read all those names, our eyes glaze over and we fall asleep and we just, we just think it's biblical filler material. Who are those? We don't know those people. They're, it's unimportant. But you know who those names were important to? The man that wrote the letter. They were important enough for Paul to write their names in the letter. And when you look at them, it occurred to me as I was reading this chapter this week how important this is. I mean, you can go your whole life, Phil, and never hear that passage read in, in church because nobody wants to read the names. <laughs> but that passage is important because it reminds us of an a, a, a important point about Paul. Paul was who Paul was, was because of the quality of his friendships and his relationships. Paul had friends. Paul was able to endure. Paul was able to go through hardship because he had people that came along beside him. Did you know that in Paul's letters, he cites the names of 100 different individuals who supported him in his work and his ministry? In Romans chapter 16 alone, he lists the name of 26 individuals who walked with him in his ministry. Uh, that first, that man by the name of Tychius shows up in Acts chapter 20 for the first time, traveled with Paul for years and all through Paul's ministry. These people, there are 10 names here listed in chapter 4, and these names listed here in chapter 4 are the names of people who were supporting Paul while he was imprisoned in Rome who were carrying out and doing work. And we remember this is how Paul's life began as a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul was on the road to Damascus when he was confronted by Jesus, knocked to his knees, and blinded. Simultaneously, while Paul was being blinded, he sent the Spirit of the Lord spoke to a man by the name of Ananias and said, You know Paul? You know Paul? He's coming to your house. And Ananias was understandably upset and said, You mean that violent aggressor who is persecuting my brothers and sisters in Christ? He's coming to my house? Yeah. I've appointed him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. When he gets there, I want you to take care of him. And when Paul arrived in Damascus, Ananias welcomed Paul into his home, laid his hands on him and prayed for him, and the scales fell from Paul's eyes. He fed him and ministered him, and they surrounded him with friends, and that's how his life began. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is about being a part of a community of friends. If we're going to begin again, if we're going to be the people that we're called to be, we need to know we can't do it alone. We need to do it. We do it with one another. But I know the objections. Because the church isn't always the place we go looking for friends. Sometimes the church can be a cold place. You walk in expecting to get a warm hug, but instead you get a cold shoulder. A few years ago, my family, we went on vacation in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Our family and another family, we drove over from Houston and we had rented a house on the beach. We got there on Saturday night. Everybody else wanted to sleep in. I'm not dogging my family for sleeping in on Sunday. We're in a preacher's family. You should sleep in whenever you can because we go to church every Sunday. They slept in. I'm up early. I found a church in the community. It was close to where we were. A large, fairly large church. Got there early. Walked around the building, walked through the education wing, and walked to the coffee place and got some coffee, read all the signs on the wall, looked at the pictures of all the ministers on the wall. I was all over the building everywhere. Got to the sanctuary, walked in, walked around, looked at the art, looked at the glass, walked in and sat down on the front row. And you know what happened? Not a single person 
said hello, shook my hand, acknowledged my presence, or welcomed me. I'd like to say I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised because that's not uncommon to walk into a church that sings what a friend we have in Jesus and to find out that we're just the frozen chosen. <laughs> and we have a friend in Jesus, but I'm not going to be here for him. You know, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus, all my griefs and sorrows to bear. But you and Jesus can be friends, but you're not going to be my friend because I'm here for me and I don't care about you. We're the frozen chosen. Not a word spoken. So you know what I did? I'm not making this up. This is not an exaggeration. When the benediction was given and the congregation stood up for the benediction and they were having the closing music, I beat a path to the back door. I stood at the back door where the preacher stands and shook every hand walking out of that building. <laughs> there you go. And they were like, who are you? I said, my name is David Emery. This is my first Sunday. I'm so glad to meet you. I told Teresa when I got home, she said, oh my gosh, I would have crawled under the pew. But it reminds us, that reminds us of the reality that we need to remember who we are, that the Church of Jesus Christ is not the only community in the world where you will find a friend. You can get friends at AA, you can get friends in the bowling league, you know, you can get friends at the gym, you can get friends at the... At Starbucks, they know your name. But the church above all places should be the place that does it better than anyone else because we are vertically and horizontally relationally designed. Vertically and horizontally relationally designed. That was hard to say. <laughs> because when we walk in, we see the cross reminding us that we relate up and we relate out and it's all about friendship. Uh, you know, we're a one another religion. Do you know there's 100 verses in the New Testament that talk about our love for one another? Here's a few of them. Accept one another. Admonish one another. Greet one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Be humble toward one another. Look to the interests of one another. Bear with one another. Teach one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Exhort one another. Stir up one another to love and good works. Love one another. Sixteen times you'll find this. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Build up one another. Be like-minded towards one another. Show hospitality to one another. Employ the gifts that God has given us to the benefit of one another. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Pray for one another. Confess your faults to one another. Four things. One, we need to be doing a better job of being a one another community of people. We need to remember that we are called to be with one another. The second thing is, is you may need to get a new friend. And what I mean by that is, not all friends are created equal. Not all friends are encouraging. Not all friends are supportive. The quality and the shape of your life will be determined by the quality and the shape of your friends. And I'm not saying that you should abandon your friends. But the reality is that there's some friends who want you to stay where you are. You know why they don't have to put a, cra a, a lid on the top of a bucket full of crabs? Because when one crab tries to crawl out, they pull it back in and grab it by the leg. And you may have friends that don't want you to go someplace new. So I will tell you, you may need to get some positive, encouraging friends. And i got to tell you, church, we need to be those kinds of friends. We need to have friends that will elevate. So maybe you need to get a some new friends. The third thing is, uh, you probably need to let your guard down. It, it's hard, you know. People say, well, David, I'm not an extrovert like you. I, don't, I, I just can't walk into a room full of people and just, you know, meet people. It's okay, I understand. Thank goodness you're not like me. <laughs> Be you. 
But in order to make friends, you've got to open yourself up and you've got to be willing to take a bit risk and be somewhat vulnerable. Because if you can't be vulnerable, you're not going to let somebody in. You've got to let, be willing to let people in. And the fourth thing I would say to you today is that don't treat the church, don't treat the church like it's a drive through fast food drive through For years, when I was an unhealthy person in my 40s, I got up in the morning, got up late, walked out of the house, got in my car, drove through the drive through at McDonald's, got a sausage biscuit covered it in grape jelly, drank a Dr. Pepper, got to work all revved up. That's not a healthy way to live. It's unhealthy. But the Lord took all that away from me. Changed my eating habits. Changed the way I live. I don't go through the drive-thru anymore on the way anywhere. And I don't eat in my car anymore. But we do it as Christians all the time. We rush in the church like it's a drive-thru. We get our grape juice and our bread and we're out. (laughs) On our way. Doing our thing. That's just as bad as eating a great biscuit full of jelly and sausage. It won't do you any good. you got to stay a while. you got to make the church a part of your family and a part of your community. And, you know, you have to lean in. And let me say this. Well, I'm just waiting for things. Don't wait. You don't like the way things are. Make it happen. Make it happen. Be the friend that you're looking for. And for families with kids, your kids will never get the full-on experience of being a follower of Jesus Christ if your participation in the life of the church is haphazard and unintentional and fast food and happy meals. I am a follower of Jesus because I grew up in a small church and was loved on by people of all ages and the friendship. We need to do a better job of being a one another church. I know it's hard. We got work to do in our world and our community. We shall overcome and we shall do it with our friends. Can we do that? No more fast food church, right church? Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this message you've given me today. May we take it to heart. May we look around and say, to our friends, I love you, I'm proud of you, I care about you, and may we be able to receive those words ourselves. Thank you for being our friend so that we can be friends with one another. In Jesus' name, all God's people did say, amen. Last week, I received my star word, humor. Well, my first thought was, what on earth, Lord of mercy, what am I going to do with this? Because I've always been known to be a person with a sense of humor. I enjoy making people laugh. Well, this past Wednesday, when Pastor David called me, God showed me what I could do. It's still the season of Epiphany. An epiphany means meaning, manifestation, appearing, in reference to the guiding star that led the Magi to the Christ child. Well, through David's invitational call, my star word, humor, manifested itself instead as humorous, as in the humorous bone. As you know, the humerus bone is the long bone in our upper arm with muscles attached to the shoulder and the elbow that enables our arms to move and even our hands. Well, unbeknownst to him, David was God's spiritual humerus bone for me, challenging, encouraging me to get connected and to participate in this way with you. You see, in my retirement as a disciple's pastor, I have been too long out of communion with whatever serving or participating I might offer you, my church family, and other communities. As for this special table, 
as you think about it, our humorous bones are very involved in the act of communion. The arms and hands of those who set this table, the arms and hands of those who filled our plastic communion bags, my arms and hands as I will break the bread and lift the cup in the words of institution, and your arms and hands as you partake of the bread and the cup. And of course, the precious arms of Jesus as he carried his cross to Golgotha, and as his arms and hands were stretched and pierced on that cross of crucifixion. Truly, God is amazing, for even the star of humorous has a welcome and valued place at this, the table of our Lord. Our elder will now offer our prayer. Loving God, thank you for this opportunity to share in communion this Sunday. During this quiet time, set aside in our service each week, we're reminded of the example that your son Jesus Christ set for us here on earth. We feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, remind us that these are symbols of the life and death of Jesus Christ. In his holy name we pray, amen. We recall on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus was gathered with his disciples at a table in an upper room. And he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and said, this bread is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. And then he took the cup and he lifted it and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in memory of me. And so we eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Beloved of God, receive now the gifts of God. Most of you know who I am, but for those of you who don't, I'm Connie McFarland. I'm just finishing my three-year service as an elder at the church. I was an elder 20 years ago, and I've considered this a bit of a retread, but not really. The last three years have been very different than the first. Being a member of the church 40 years, a lot of things happen, but time goes so different for different people. And the last three been quite different. We lost a minister or two, and we gained a new minister, a wonderful new David Emery. We had a pandemic. I know you all knew about that. Um, <laughs> David's first Sunday was here on uh, Palm Sunday in a completely empty sanctuary. 
um, doing a virtual service. We have learned to do virtual, except I still don't chat very well when I'm trying to comment in the chat line for the virtual. But we also learned to put on our masks and, and come to church and gather together. And it's been quite a time to make it through the help of our friends here at Harvard Avenue. Um, Rabbi Harold Kushner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, is the thesis is that the faith community is about the friendship when something bad happens. And, and we've been in a good example of that this last three years, two for sure. We, um, we're going to begin again. It's a, a new year, and we've had a lot of help from our friends, and we're going to continue to march on through. We're going to be new elders, and there'll be those of you who are deacons and those who are serving on committees. That is all making our church work, and we fund all of this good work through your tithes and offerings. If the deacons will please come forward. The tone and nature of political and social debate in this country has become more and more negative and toxic. Please pay attention. The impetus of this song emerged from watching and listening to people on opposing sides of numerous issues, not really listening, but preferring to belittle the other's opinion. When both sides are eloquently and thoughtfully spoken and really listened to. Maybe we can arrive at solutions that have eluded us for generations. Why are so many drowned out by so few? not sure what to do. Plenty of blame can be passed all around, but blame doesn't fix, only slows it all down. Running from truth just so we can play nice. Not standing strong and at such a high price. Little by little, the shadows move in. But where's it all going? Where do we begin? Once there were voices. Now their influence and voice is hyped and so strong. It's an upside-down picture that's taken the stage. It's a three-ring circus. It's a battle we wage. It's a darkness so loaded with bias and rage. Can you tell me why are so many drowned out by so few? There's a cloud of deception that lies. to a small but growing loud and angry Call unenlightened. 
But we could gain back the lost ground with some clear and simple kind and loving these gifts and help us use these tithes to continue to build your community here on earth. In your name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you, Phil, for being here today. Thank you, Kelly, for that beautiful piece. Uh, we know you're in high demand in our community. We're so grateful we're here. And thank you, uh, Kim, Pastor Kim, for being here today. Kevin's going to be out for a couple weeks. They got something coming this week, like we said earlier. We'll let you know as soon as we hear the good news about the birth of our newest baby. And Connie, thank you for three years of serving as elder. You know, uh, she's been one of the really, really done a great job just calling and checking in with people. And uh, you've been not only a good friend of the church, but you've been a good friend for me. And I love you and thank you. Thank you so much. I give you two invitations today. One is um, this one another stuff. We're going to be talking about groups in a couple weeks respond to the invitation. The other is, if Christ is calling you, I would love to welcome you to be a part of our church family today. To quote James Taylor, you've got a friend. <laughs> Corny, I know, but you do have a friend. And we'd love to welcome you today through the confession of your faith, the transfer of your membership to Harvard Avenue Christian Church. Come as we sing. <clears throat> Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Well, next Sunday, we hope it's going to be warmer. <laughs> we hope to see more of our friends back with us next week. Hopefully, we're going to see this virus go the other way. Let's all wish it down, right? Can, <laughs> amen? Let's get it down. Everybody get well. Take care of yourself. Have a great week. You do have a friend. We have a friend in Jesus. We have a friend in one another. Go and love and serve and give and be your very best this week because God's going to give God's very best to you. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>